during our first two sessions this morning, we have looked at um, the pillars of Imam, Iman, or theology, belief within Islam, and tried to look at the worldview that these pillars reflect and how we can um, work within that worldview as faithful ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Um, now we want to look at the other pillars, um, which are the pillars of, of duty. So remember, we said this morning that uh, we can think of Islam as a house. Islam is referred to as the house of Islam. This is the roof of the house, and this house is supported by pillars. Uh, five, or many will say, six pillars of belief, and then five pillars, or many will say, six pillars of duty. So we've looked this morning at the five pillars of belief, and now we will explore the five pillars of, um, of, of duty. I'll introduce these pillars of duty by sharing uh, a story. Uh, when we were in Somalia, I heard that the imam in the mosque uh, was preaching against me. Well, the Bible says, seek peace and pursue it. <laughs> and so my Muslim friends shared with me, the imam is preaching against you. You better be cautious when walking in the village for a few days until, until, um, uh, until we report back that, that, that things have calmed down. Um, and uh, I said, well, then in that case, I need, to meet, I need to meet the imam. No, no, they think that would not be why. You just, I said, look, if he's preaching against me, I need to find what his case against me is. So arrange for me to meet him. No, no, I said, look, give me his name. If you won't bring him to my house, I will go to the mosque personally. With his name, I will meet with him and we will talk together to hear his case against me. So they knew I was serious. So my Muslim friend says, okay, we'll arrange for him to come. So they went and talked with him. And they said that Daud Sheikh wants to have a conversation with you to hear your case against him. And so they brought him. And um, as he, with, he came with several of his disciples, and he had his prayer beads reciting the 99 names of God as he came up the walk toward our house. And we welcomed him in and sat in our living room. And my dear wife brought uh, some, some tea, Somali tea, which is nicely spiced, and also some cookies. And he broke them open and smelt them to make sure there was no pork in the cookies. There was only dates in the cookies, so he was very happy about that. And uh, as he ate these cookies, he said, there's a rumor about you in this town. So, well, here it comes. So I wonder what the case is he has against me. He said, the rumor is that you want to go to heaven when you die. Oh, I said, that's not a rumor. That is true. I want to go to heaven when I die. He says, how astonishing. I thought that all Christians want to go to hell. So you are a Christian and you want to go to heaven. I said, absolutely. Well, he said, I've never heard of such a thing. You see how our Muslims and Christians misunderstand each other? We never talk with each other about our faith. And this dear man thought that Christians really want to go to hell. No, 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 no. I said, I want to go to heaven. He said, Alhamdulillah. May I tell you how to go to heaven? I said, gladly. And so he worked through these five pillars of duty. He says, you must do the five pillars of duty. The first, you must believe in God and that Muhammad is a prophet of God. La ilallah Muhammadun Rasulullah, the confession of faith. Secondly, he said, you must pray five times a day facing Mecca, the Salat, the required Salat, the required prayers. We talked about that earlier this morning. And thirdly, he said, you must give alms to the poor, the zakat. And there's a certain percentage that Muslims are to give. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a well-attested uh, percentage. And you then also need to fast during the month of Ramadan, Saum, from sunrise to sundown. You must fast. And then he says, and if possible, take the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Those five pillars of duty you must do in order to get to heaven. Well, I said, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. I said, I believe in one God. I pray more than five times a day. And I 
fast? Not enough. I'll spruce up on my fasting. And uh, I give to the poor. They give more than the required amount to the poor. And I'll save money to get to Mecca as quickly as possible. Oh, he said, Alhamdulillah, you're a Muslim. Praise be to God. But he said, uh, don't tell your wife. You can be a secret believer and then slowly persuade her also to become a Muslim. And then you, you and your wife can work on the other missionaries on, in the, here at the school. So they also become Muslim. And so you can be a secret missionary for Islam among the missionaries. But don't tell them because if you tell them, they'll stop your salary. So pretend to be a Christian yet for a while while you try to persuade them to become Muslim. I said, praise be to God. So I'm a Muslim now. Yes, absolutely. And I said, what about heaven? Well, he said, maybe you will go to heaven. Oh, no, 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 no. I said, it's not a rumor that I want to get to heaven for sure. I said, I do not want at the end of life to discover I'm headed to hell. I need to know. He said, nobody knows. And he said, there's the scales, the balance scales. And these pillars of duty are required to go on the good side of the scales. But then the wrong that you do goes on the other side of the scales. And so you never know which side is the heavier until the final judgment. He didn't say this, but you might be aware, you might observe, after our Muslim friends have completed their prayers, uh, the required salat, they would look this way and that way to their shoulders. And what they're doing is greeting the angels that are on each of their shoulders. And the angels are recording the good that you do and the bad that you do. And so you're saying to the angels, notice, I've said my prayers. You know, be sure you get that recorded. You see? It's because it's, of it's, this balance scales. But you never know which side is the heavier. Why well, I said to him, are you going to heaven when you die? He said, I don't know. But Islam is the best bet. I said, that's not good enough for me. Now remember that in Somali, it was against the law to propagate Christianity. And here's an imam who's been preaching against me in the mosque. So I said to him, may I share my heart with you? I said, I'm a Christian, a believer in Jesus, the Messiah. May I share my heart with you? Yes, very gladly. But I said, please do not become angry with what I'm going to share. No, no, no. He said, you're free. And so I reached over to my shelf and I took my Quran from the shelf. I said, I read this book. Oh, you are a Muslim. You read the Quran. Absolutely, I read the Quran. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And I said, it says exactly what you say, that we cannot know, that there's a scales, and the good we do goes on one side of the scales, and the wrong we do on the other side of the scales, and only at the final judgment will we ever know. All of this is in the Quran. You're exactly right, what the Quran teaches. But I said, there's another book that I read. It's called The Bible. The Injil is in the Bible. And I said, in this book, I read, within the Injil, that Jesus the Messiah is the way to heaven, for sure. And people were asking Jesus, what's the way? How can we know the way to heaven? And Jesus says, I am the way. You see. <laughs> and that's for sure. And I said, years ago, I believed in Jesus the Messiah and committed my life to him and the Spirit of God filled me with complete assurance, the guarantee, the Spirit of God within me, the guarantee that indeed I'm headed to heaven. So there's not a question mark in my mind at all. I know where I'm headed. Jesus is my Savior. He is the way. I'm walking within that way. He has promised me heaven eternally. And so the scales, because of what Jesus has done, is no more. Jesus is my Savior. So which path shall I take, my dear friend? The path of Islam, which says there's the scales and you never really know? Or 
the path of Jesus who promises eternal salvation and whose spirit, the spirit of God lives within me, assuring me that that is true, that I'm on the way to heaven. Which path do you advise? And that dear Imam said, is that really what the Injil says? I said, absolutely. Then he said, I strongly urge you to continue being a Christian. And later on, my Muslim friends told me that he stopped preaching against me absolutely in the mosque. And if he found anyone in the village ever speaking against me, and there's always people speaking against me, you know, I, I was the headmaster of the school, and a student got a C when he thought he should have gotten an A, and he's talking in the village about this terrible shank, you know, the unjust grades, that kind of thing. And you always have those sorts of things going on. But if he ever found anyone speaking against me, he would say, don't do that. I've gone to the home of Daoud Sheikh. I've drunk tea and eaten cookies that his wife has prepared. We have talked about the deep things of God. And I want you to know that man is going to heaven. And that's for sure. So he himself became a witness to the good news of the gospel. Isn't that something? You see? So these pillars of duty are very important for our Muslim friends. And their obligations, which you have to do. I remember when I was in, um, in, 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 in London for those six dialogues in UK universities. And the one was at the Central London Mosque. And now host, I was hosted by the Muslim Student Association for those that, that week and we're in the car now going to the airport I'm headed off to Lithuania and the Muslim I was in dialogue with is headed back to Canada and in the car he said to me David if the gospel is what you have shared if that's really what it is if the gospel is what you have shared these this week together it is good news for me as a Muslim it would be very freeing to become a Christian. You see? When I was in Afghanistan, I uh, visited, uh, had opportunity to speak with a number of Muslim leaders. And it was during the month of Ramadan, and, um, and when everybody was fasting. And the conversations in each of those cases with these Muslim leaders, in each case, it went this way. David, are you fasting? Actually, I'm not fasting. Why not? Well, I said, Jesus has freed us from the burden of religious ritual. Well, do you pray five times a day? Well, I pray constantly, but I do not do ritual prayers. I don't do salat. Why not? Jesus has freed us from the burden of religious ritual. And in each case, they said, please find a way for us to get a Bible. <laughs> you see, um, the, these, the, these pillars of duty um, can become a duty. <laughs> now certainly for many Muslims, they participate in these pillars of duty and they don't experience it as a burden at all. But for many, it is it is pretty heavy. And Jesus has, has set aside the scales. Um, he is the Savior. And he frees us from this kind of obligatory religious ritual. But the Christian faith is so very, very freeing. Um, now, for many Muslims, they will add a sixth pillar of duty, which is jihad. And um, there are two kinds of jihad, the lesser and the greater jihad. The greater jihad is the jihad of the soul to make sure that you are truly, truly faithfully Muslim. That when you do the prayers, the salat, you're not just doing it as an obligation 
but you are really doing it out of a sincere desire to submit to the will of God. Um, when you fast, you're not doing it as an obligation, but you're doing it because you really love the will of God, to be sure that you're truly, sincerely Muslim. The struggle within the soul to be sincere about your faith practices. That's the greater jihad. Then there is the lesser jihad. And the lesser jihad has to do with defending the house of Islam. Within this house of Islam resides the ummah. And the ummah needs the security of this house. And so if there are forces that are threatening this house of Islam, that are eating away at one pillar or another pillar of this house of Islam, you see, that can threaten the whole house of Islam. And if the house is threatened, then the integrity of the ummah itself um, is, uh, is, is threatened. And so that's the lesser jihad, to strive in the way of God. Jihad means to strive in the way of God. That's what it means. It doesn't mean holy war. No, 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 no. It means striving in the way of God. To strive in the way of God so that the house of Islam may be protected. So the first and greatest jihad, the jihad of your inner soul, the lesser jihad then, to strive to protect the integrity of the house of Islam and the ummah that resides within that house, you see. Now that lesser jihad is expressed in several ways. The first and foremost way is through the Quran itself. When I meet with Muslims in the mosques and so forth that I often do, um, they defend Islam always by quoting the Quran, by memory. I mean, most, all, I suppose, Muslim imams have memorized the whole Quran in Arabic from beginning to end. This Ahmed Haile that I'm writing his memoirs with, he had memorized the whole Quran by the time he was 10 years old. Uh, the entire Quran. It's about the size of the New Testament. Memorized it in Arabic. And so they will quote the Quran very liberally in their defense of Islam, you see, or in their confrontation with some of the things I'm saying in regards to the Christian faith. So the first way in which this jihad is expressed is through the use of the Quran in defending the truth of Islam. Another way in which the jihad is expressed is through the pen, or I say the mouth oftentimes. This is apologetics through literature. All over the world, our Muslim friends are producing literature, apologetic literature, which communicate the truth of Islam and defend Islam against the detractors and those who would critique and so forth, you see. Um, so the jihad of the pen, that's another expression of the, of the lesser jihad. And um, then, as a very last alternative in terms of the lesser jihad, is the use of the sword when the pen and the Quran are inadequate, are not adequate to preserving the integrity of the house of Islam and preserving the integrity of the Ummah, then as a very last resort, why um, the sword needs to be used to protect the house of Islam from attack. So many will add the sixth pillar, the pillar of jihad. To, um, to, to the five pillars of Islam. When I first started meeting with Muslims 40-some years ago in Somalia and then in Kenya, uh, I never heard them refer to jihad as a sixth pillar uh, within, uh, within the House of Islam. But in the last 10 years, I would say quite frequently, when I meet with Muslims and I would share with them, and please just explain again what the pillars of Islam are all about, they'll, they'll talk about five and then they'll say, and there's, then there's the sixth pillar, the pillar of jihad. That is a pillar which is becoming more and more significant, I think, because of the global sense that Muslims have that somehow the House of Islam is under threat in many different ways with global developments. And so that, that sixth pillar is, is being talked about much more than was the case some years ago, as I see it, as I see it. Yeah. Now, as we know, when you are using the sword to protect it is so easy also for the sword to become an offensive weapon, not just a protecting weapon. Um, it's like um, the U.S. invading Iraq. Um, defensive wars become offensive wars, you see. 
um, so quickly. And certainly we know that throughout the history of the world, there have been times that the Islamic uh, call to jihad has become an offensive um, movement rather than a defensive movement. Um, Katarega, in this book, the, in, uh, this dialogue with me, <laughs> talks about that. And the position he takes is when jihad becomes offensive, it is somehow moving away from the Quranic call to what jihad should really be about. It's an aberration, it's a distortion of the essence of jihad when it becomes offensive. But he admits that sometimes it has become an offensive movement. Yeah. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. So let me pause for response or questions. Yes. I wonder, I said, how many Muslims would know the Quran by memory or big portions of Quran? Probably many. Of some Very people. many do. Very many do. Uh, certainly in Islamic societies like the ones I've lived in in East Africa, the little boys and girls, when they're, you know, three or four, begin going to the, uh, to the little duxi, to the little Quranic school. And the idea is that you memorize the Quran first, then that opens your mind to all other areas of knowledge, but the, but the Quran needs to be absorbed first of all. And so by the time they're eight or 10, many, many will be able to recite the Quran by memory. They'll memorize it in Arabic, even though they don't know Arabic, you see. And so they may have memorized it, the poetry and so forth, but don't really understand all that they're saying. But some will know the Arabic and they understand it, absolutely. Um, I was in a dialogue in, in, in Tirana, Albania here a couple years ago with a Muslim scholar, theologian, a kind of a poet. And he was making the comment about this very point, that we Muslims memorize the Quran because we want to have the, the, the power of the Quran incarnated within us. And then he made this very interesting comment, you Christians don't have that same drive to memorize scripture because you are filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit infills you with the power of God. And so you have the Holy Spirit, but we have the Quran. So we want the Quran to become incarnated within us, and for you the Spirit and the life of Christ is incarnated within you through the Holy Spirit. Very interesting observation coming from a Muslim theologian. I think there's a lot of truth in that. That is not to mean that we should not memorize Scripture. It's important to memorize Scripture. Um, but we do have that gift of the Holy Spirit who is the Word, who becomes the Word incarnate within us mm -hmm. and empowering us. Yes? I'd like to hear more about the greater jihad. How does a Muslim determine whether his faith is genuine? Now, that becomes a very personal thing. I think the greater jihad is a very personal, a very personal challenge. You mentioned that mm -hmm. uh, they believe that there's a power in Quran. Yes. And I know that Orthodox Church believe there's a power in cross, and there's a power in, in icon, in holy water, that there could be power uh, which can be held in some material things. What, uh, in general, uh, Muslims believe about this? So they believe that power can be uh, contained in some material stuff, like a quorum or something Magic like that? Things. Yeah, yeah, certainly, it's certainly, it particularly, I'm hoping later on in the course we have some time to look at folk Islam. So let's just hold that question. But the, the whole folk Islam movement is, is related to that, that sort of thing, trying to find access to power. Mm -hmm. But at the center of all of that is the Quran. Yeah. The Quran, we'll talk more about that a little later. I want to uh, make a couple comments yet about topic five on Muslim theology and praxis as we wrap up that theme. Um, and it has to do with, um, with this House of Islam and the Ummah being safely um, protected within the House of Islam. And um, we can understand that concern that you want the house of Islam to be intact and preserved, and that the integrity of the ummah needs to be preserved. The um, challenge 
that this understanding brings into the conversation with Muslims and Christians is um, how is, is the ways in which the Muslim community responds if someone decides to convert. Um, and in my dialogue with Muslims in different countries, including in the United States, I suppose this question is the one that occupies our dialogical conversation <coughs> as profoundly as any other question. Because as I hear our Muslim friends, the conviction is that the Ummah must function in whatever way necessary to prevent anyone from leaving the Ummah and converting to follow Christ and become a member of the church. That just is not acceptable. And my Muslim friends say it's not acceptable because if people begin to convert away from the Ummah, that would destroy the Ummah. And so the rights of the community supersede the rights of the individual to choose his or her faith. Now, this presentation will go far beyond Baptist and Mennonite communities, which I believe we are mostly comprising of, of those communities here. And so um, I, um, I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, but I'll just say that in the engagement with Muslims in regards to this question, as Baptists and Mennonites and Pentecostal groups and so forth enter into the conversation, one of the gifts we offer within the conversation is our conviction that a person is free to choose. And our uh, commitment to adult baptism is a loud and clear, wit clear witness that that's what we believe. I cannot determine the faith of my children, you see. They must choose if they will believe or not believe. And all of us who are parents, probably, have experienced some of the grief of what that can mean. For some of us, not all of our children are believers in Jesus, you know. And we weep over that, but they're free. They're free to choose. And adult baptism is a sign of that reality. And that conviction goes right to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve are free to choose to believe or not to believe. Jesus washes the feet of Judas, who's the, who's the betrayer, but then frees him that night to go out into the dark and do what he chose to do, you see. God gives us freedom. And adult baptism is built into our faith and practice as Baptists and Mennonites and Pentecostal communities. Um, and we bear witness in the conversation with Muslims that that's where we stand. That's what we believe. And we plead with them to hear that witness. God gives a person freedom to choose. But I would say that in my dialogical engagement with Muslims, whether it be internationally or in the USA, this question comes to the fore again and again and again. And, um, and oftentimes I'm touched with, I will confess, with grief uh, as I interact with Muslims in regard to this question. For it is very hard for my Muslim friends to accept that a person has the freedom to choose. If that choice means that they would be leaving the Muslim Ummah, in that case the Ummah must take action to prevent that from happening, uh, if at all possible. And sometimes, as we know, that action moves in directions which um, I believe uh, are tragic. Um, but it has to do with this conviction that the Ummah must be preserved in whatever way possible from, um, from anything that may destroy it. And conversions away from the Ummah and the, become destructive, is the understanding, you see. Um, I say to my Muslim friends, <laughs> gently but forthrightly, uh, in this case, if a person is not free to leave, you are creating a prison. And um, <laughs> God gives us the freedom to choose, not to build prisons. Um, that's my conviction. Although I say when I share that with my Muslim friends, 
they uh, are not very happy with that analogy. <laughs> but it's true. If we are not developing fellowships of faith that give people freedom to choose, then whether you're a Baptist or a Muslim, uh, we're creating prisons. You know, people are free. God gives, them, gives, gives us that freedom to choose. Yes, comment. Quran, that kind of at least give a glimpse of this freedom that's allowed by Allah or something. Does Allah give freedom? Yes, I yes. Mean, there is a Quranic verse which I use very often in my conversation with Muslims and which Badru Katarega uses, by the way. Katarega, who wrote this dialogue with me, he would agree with what I'm saying, that people should be free to choose. He is very, uh, a very liberal and, um, and um, Muslim who is very much in touch with the worldwide Muslim movement. But he often would say to me, and, and, and in dialogical engagements, that in the Quran we read, there is no compulsion in religion. If there's no compulsion in religion, it means people are free to choose, you see. So it's not just as Anabaptists that we bring that into the, into the arena. There is within the Quran an affirmation for that conviction that we're free to choose. The law of apostasy actually developed after Muhammad, um, but has become very much built into the structure of much of worldwide Islam today. But it came after Muhammad. The Quran itself says there's, 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 uh, there's no compulsion in religion. And so as Christians, we are called to engage with the Muslim community and with Muslims, bearing witness to Jesus, who is our Savior, our Lord, um, as God opens the door, and to serve in the spirit and the power of Christ, um, which is the spirit of humility, the spirit of respect for the other, the spirit of, um, of gentleness and respect. That's our calling. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.